Hello, this is West Bloomfield 911. I'm Officer Rick, and on behalf of Chief Mike Patton and my brothers and sisters in the West Bloomfield Police Department, welcome to another show. We have with us today a very nice young lady, very generous young lady, Catherine Distillrath, who is the field coordinator for the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. Catherine, how are you? Good, how are you? Good, good. And I say that because we first met when you came to give blood when we had our annual blood drive to remember Sergeant O'Rourke, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Please don't leave us. We are going to do a segment we call a corner spotlight, where we highlight an employee in the West Bloomfield Police Department. Okay? Don't run away. Okay. Folks, if you look on the screen, you will see the smiling countenance of police officer Andrew Majeski. He's currently assigned to the afternoon shift road patrol, and Andrew's a relative newbie. He's been with us since February of 2015, and uh, he's a good young kid, and yes, ladies, he's as handsome in person as he is on the screen. His favorite food, chicken. You know, Andrew, I like chicken too, especially that chicken that's no good for me, deep fried or broasted, but I do like it. And uh, for a young man, I'm very impressed. He loves historical novels, not a particular novel, but he loves history, so Andrew, keep that up. That'll make you a well-rounded young man. His favorite movie, you know what, in our business we see a lot of things that people aren't supposed to see. He loves comedies, and that is a good choice. Andrew, we need to lighten up and enjoy life and laugh a little bit when we take the badge and gun off for the day. And uh, he loves music. He said he kind of likes it all, but he's particularly partial to alternative rock and roll. So I can see Andrew opening up that historical novel, then closing it, watching a comedy, and then rocking out the night. So. Kids, if you want to be a good young man when you grow up, be like Andrew. Andrew loves to wrestle. In fact, he received a wrestling scholarship from William Penn University in Oskaloosa, Iowa. I didn't even know there was such a place. And if you see Andrew in person, he's a pretty strong kid, and uh, he takes good care of himself. But even though he got the scholarship to Oskaloosa, he completed his studies here at home at Western, Western Michigan University. And when I asked him about some of the things he's particularly proud of, he said he's very proud of the fact that he attended and completed the police academy. And we are too, because if you didn't do that, we wouldn't have you here. And he has many hobbies. We heard of some of them, but again, one of them is staying in shape, and he loves weightlifting. When I asked him about a particular quote of the day, he said his favorite is, he conquers who conquers himself, which is actually a Latin saying. And uh, I can say it better in English than I can in Latin, but uh, I'm gonna butcher it, I know that, but I'm gonna try it anyway. Vincit qui se vincit. He conquers who conquers himself. So ladies, he is a big, strong young man. We're glad to have him. Andrew, I hope you have a long and illustrious career here in West Bloomfield. So enjoy yourself, enjoy the job and continue to do the fine job for the people of West Bloomfield that you're doing now. Let's turn the corner spotlight off on police officer Andrew Majeski. And folks, you know, I get a lot of calls and I'm gonna kinda run this home over the next few shows that we do because I get a ton of calls from people who tell me they're getting called by someone claiming to be from the IRS and wanting personal information. I can tell you right now, right off the bat, that you know what? No agency, whether it be a federal agency like the IRS or the West Bluefield Police Department or your bank, are going to call you over the phone and start asking you for personal information. Think about it. The IRS already knows more about you than you want them to know. They don't have to call and get that information. And if they need to get a hold of you for professional reasons, they will do it by letter through the Postal Service. So if you get a call like that, just ignore it. In fact, I would say don't even answer the phone. If you don't know who's calling you, you don't recognize the number, you don't recognize the name, let it go to voicemail. The way things are set up nowadays, people can call and make it look like they're calling from next door when in fact they're calling from the other side of the world. So don't give out any personal or private information to anyone, I don't care who they identify themselves as, unless you know for certain that's them because you have made previous overtures to them. Just avoid talking to them whatsoever. But if you ever need help, certainly give us a call at the West Bloomfield Police Department or me, Officer Rick, 
in the Crime Prevention Unit. But stay safe, don't give them any information. Folks, we'll be right back. We are going to talk with Catherine Distillrath, a valued employee of the Michigan, of the state of Michigan. So please, come on back. You're watching West Bloomfield 911 on Civic Center TV, a service of the Greater West Bloomfield Cable Communications Commission. For more information or to watch episodes on demand, visit civiccentertv.com slash WB911. Civic Center TV, television that's close to home. Michigan is a melting pot of various cultures and races in which we all live side by side. The Anti-Defamation League is an organization that focuses on fighting anti-Semitism and bigotry of all kinds. The ADL works with schools and businesses to provide education and outreach to the community. To learn more about the Michigan Regional Anti-Defamation League, visit michigan.adl.org or call 248-353-7553. Hello and welcome back to West Bloomfield 911. We are talking with Catherine Distillreth, Field Coordinator for the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. Catherine, thank you for coming on. Glad to be here. You know, when we went off the air there for a minute, you had said something, and I'd like you to repeat it. You said, you know, that's a good tip because... Yeah, about the IRS, because there's lots of... This happens with more than just phone calls. Like, people sometimes come door to door um, posing like their electric companies or gas companies right. um, and you know trying to give people saying that they're gonna give people a good deal good rates but then the rate skyrockets after yeah. you know the first month or something right. and so and I think that they specifically target people who are low-income people whose first language is not English people who are elderly things like that mm -hmm. so um, because they know that those populations are more vulnerable so right. it's just another thing to look out for well, you know, it's, it's fascinating you brought that up because we had on a, uh, another guest in another show and she'd mentioned uh, someone she knew who was an immigrant, uh, English not being his primary language, owned a business and he had received a call and it came up from the DTE mm -hmm. giving him some scam and threatening to shut his power off. Well, she had a connection at DTE and called and they said, eh, we don't even know what they're talking about, mm -hmm. just tell them to disregard. So you're absolutely right, that stuff happens all the mm -hmm. time, yeah. unfortunately. Right. You know, and you know, and I'd mentioned when we started out, your kind heart, and and I and I sincerely mean that because we actually met when you uh, came to a f um, blood drive that we had, our second annual blood drive to remember Sergeant Patrick O'Rourke and to help the American Red Cross, and that's how we met. Mm -hmm. And um, so, and you were, it was a cold. You know, you just came in off the street, so we were so glad that you, you did that and contributed to that. We were very uh, happy that you were there. But I spoke to you at that time, and we talked about you coming on the show, and, mm -hmm. well, and here well, I am. Here you are. <laughs> yeah. Well, let's talk a little bit about what you do, because uh, not only was that very kind of you to come and, and donate blood, uh, which is something that's very much needed, but you are uh, you have a master's in social work mm -hmm. so you deal with people's problems all the time just as we do but in a different capacity as law enforcement so let's talk about you know your degree and how you got started and uh, what you're doing now so you w when did you graduate you went to the university of michigan and <laughs> <laughs> Jokes, <laughs> <I say that. laughs> don't hold it against me. <laughs> I won't. And I say that all jokingly. I don't want any calls or complaints uh, because my daughter is going to graduate mm -hmm. from MSU. But you graduate from uh, U of M in Ann Arbor with your master's. Mm -hmm. and uh, But you did your undergrad actually in Cleveland. Mm -hmm. Talk a little bit about that. Yeah, I went. It was a, a small school to John Carroll University, um, a small Catholic school. And I went there for four years, loved Cleveland. I really loved getting to know the community there, and I built a really great network of people there. Did you say you loved Cleveland? I loved Cleveland. <laughs> people diss it, but you know, people diss Detroit, too, right, and I absolutely. love Detroit as well. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, but I'm glad to be back in Michigan and working in Detroit, and I love the people here, too. And you worked for how long in Cleveland after your undergrad? A year. A year, mm -hmm. okay. And it's funny you said something to me off air that uh, you see Cleveland as being... Uh, Detroit is where Cleveland was 10 years ago mm -hmm. because they kind of came out of their funk a little sooner than we did. Yeah, I think yeah. so. They've kind of like gone through their renaissance. At, mm -hmm. Well, you know, they're still going sure. through it at this point, but Detroit, you know, is kind of starting to go through that same right. 
um, sort of renaissance, I think. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, you can't, who did you work for in Cleveland, may I ask? For the <laughs> university that I went to. I oh, worked I um, in the department of, oh, that's bad, I can't even remember. <laughs> you worked in that department. <laughs> it was, um, <laughs> It was like the we did community service, so we um, planned community service opportunities for college mm -hmm. for the students at the university to go into the community. So we had over a hundred community partners, um, and we just organized the activities for the students to go there and do community service. So it would be like um, in prisons, in schools, um, in after school programs, okay. anything like that. Absolutely, that's great. Mm -hmm. But you wanted to come back home. I did, yep. yep. Well, welcome back. We're glad to hear see you back here. You are a loyal daughter of the state of Michigan, and uh, you, in fact, work for the state of Michigan. I do. And let's talk a little bit about what it is you're doing. I was looking at your bio, and uh, your organization provides housing and support services for people experiencing chronic homelessness. So, you know, it's kind of become a big issue. In fact, I saw an article in the... Uh, uh, Michigan Catholic not long ago and they were mm -hmm. talking about homelessness. Is that worse now than it was in the past or are we just becoming more aware of it? Can you kind of touch on that a bit? You know, I think it's not worse. I think we are probably just becoming more aware of it. Mm -hmm. um, I I don't think the statistics would say that it's necessarily worse now. Yeah. Um, but I think that there's a lot more, I think that the federal government is starting to pay a lot more attention to it. And so because of that, you know, it kind of trickles down. And so there's just a lot more awareness right. around it now. And there's a lot more resources that are being put into programming now Well, that's too. good. That's good. Now, what are some of the, uh, you support, uh, give uh, housing. How is it, if, I, if I'm homeless, obviously if I'm out of work, it's kind of hard to uh, have a house and support what a house needs. So kind of go through the process. If I come to you or to your organization, and I say, Catherine, you know, I'm down on my luck and I need some help. Mm -hmm. Kind of take us through that process. Well, so first let me explain. So I work for the state of Michigan and we actually provide grants for agencies to, they're the ones who actually do the work. So they're on the ground doing the work, doing the outreach, helping people find housing mm -hmm. and providing support services. So if somebody went to one of their agencies, we really operate under a housing first model. So housing is always the first priority. Okay. Um, and so if somebody walked into one of their agencies, they would um, try, you know, assess them. And we have an assessment tool that we use that we call the SPDAT. So it's the Service Prioritization Decision Assistance Tool. That's a mouthful. And it is a mouthful. <laughs> That's why we call it the SPDAT. And so the agency would use that tool to assess um, the person's acuity to try to find out, you know, um, where they where they might well we have a whole process so it's so let me start from the beginning so <laughs> that we have a coordinated assessment model that we use um, that every community and every county in Michigan is supposed to use so a person would walk into the um, housing agency and they would be assessed and then they would be prioritized based okay. on that um, their assessment. score on the assessment tool yeah Okay. And then, so in some communities, there's lots of housing um, that's a readily available, and so people can get right into housing. In some communities, like Detroit, in really most communities, there's not enough housing available, and so they have to prioritize okay. in order to use the resources most effectively. Okay. And what are some of those? Uh, is the idea you had said you know, housing first, and I'd read that somewhere else, and I thought that was rather interesting. Is that because the idea is that if you don't have a place to live, then you can't take a shower, you don't have a stable mm -hmm. residence, and it makes it harder to find work and all that other stuff? Yeah, definitely. I think, and it's sort of the idea that everybody deserves a home, mm -hmm. first of all, so that's sort of like the ideological idea behind it. And then it's also a really practical thing, um, like the things that you're saying. Once you, if you are housed, if you have a roof over your head, then you're much more likely to be able to um, get any medical conditions under control to get employed, you know, all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the group that you work for within the state of Michigan, mm -hmm. you're more or less like the facilitator for all that, mm -hmm. and um, it's a third party that's contracted out to actually go about and 
and help those people directly. Yeah, okay. so we contract with agencies all over the state um, that actually provide the services. So there's three of us who work specifically in Detroit and coordinate the programs there. Mm -hmm. um, and then we have staff, staff in Lansing that coordinate the programs throughout the rest of the state. Okay, and when you say you work in Detroit, is that strictly uh, Detroit proper or would that entail all of Wayne County? You know, that's a good question. It depends on the program. We okay. have a lot of different programs, and so some of them are just Detroit, and some of them are the entire county. Okay. Now, what is it, uh, some of the support services that uh, you guys look for that you would provide? I know you mentioned getting um, medical conditions under control, so would that be working with a clinic or a doctor or a hospital to help these people with their medical conditions? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we have really amazing case managers um, who, we have housing navigators who help people find housing, locate the housing and negotiate that whole process and then we have case managers who provide support services so that might be linking um, linking people to medical care, to mental health, mm -hmm. um, just helping them, you know, being in the home with them every once in a while whenever they need them really to help um, set up appointments or even like daily living skills if some people need that cooking and cleaning and stuff sure. like that. Now do you find that um, in, in your um, experience are most of the people who require this help is it kind of split evenly between uh, single individuals and families or how does that mix work? There are actually more single individuals than families. Um, we, we kind of think of people in three different populations, so single individuals, families, and then youth, unaccompanied youth. Okay. Um, and so they kind of go in that order too. Single individuals are definitely the largest population, and then families are the second largest, and unaccompanied youth would be the third. Okay. And when you're mentioning uh, housing, are we speaking about uh, single family homes, or would housing entail also like flats, duplexes, apartments, whatever fits their need? Yeah, it's everything. It kind of depends on the location. In the more rural areas, mm -hmm. it would probably be more single family homes. Um, but in the more urban areas, it's a lot of apartments. Okay. Now you, um, you mentioned also that um, uh, when we're talking individuals, uh, how do you guys work with uh, the VA Veterans Administration, mm -hmm. do you guys interchange and work together? Yeah, uh, we work really that. closely with the VA. Um, I can speak specifically about in Detroit, we work with the um, John Dingle of VA Center mm -hmm. very closely. They have um, a homeless, yeah, they have a unit there that's devoted to homelessness. Um, and so, you know, we're constantly interfacing with them, um, trying to coordinate services and navigation and everything. And there's a big push right now to end veteran homelessness. It was by the end of 2015, but now it's by the end of 2016. And okay. we're getting really, really close. So a lot really? of communities throughout the nation have already done it. Wow. Um, in Detroit, we have a by name list right now of veterans. So there's, I think at the last count, there were like around 140, don't quote me on that, mm -hmm. but around 140 veterans on this list. So we know the veterans by name. Um, and the, the case managers and the outreach workers are out there every day trying to find those people and get them housing. You know, I, I had read uh, in an article recently, for instance, you, and we all have seen these people, these poor souls that when you're driving, and it's not just in the city of Detroit, now you see them in many of the suburbs as well, someone with a sign saying, I'm mm -hmm. homeless or help me. Does the state or your organization or, or do you contract with other organizations that actually go out to meet these folks, because a lot of them are, may have mental issues, uh, addiction issues, um, maybe they mistrust the system, they feel the system's let them down or whatever. Do you outreach to these individuals? Mm -hmm. And how do you do that? Can you, you, can yeah, I yeah, that's a really big part of what we do, um, outreach. So the, we, the state of Michigan has a program called PATH, which is, um, stands for Projects for assistance in transition from homelessness. There's also another PATH program that's something else, but this is specific to homelessness. So um, that program is statewide. It's in several counties throughout the state. I think there's 21 programs altogether, and there's five that are specifically in Detroit. Mm -hmm. And so there's five agencies that have this program. And so they have trained outreach workers who are out on the streets every day trying to um, find people to bring them into services and lots of times it's difficult at first because yes. people have to 
people have gone through a lot of experiences where um, trust has been broken, and so the outreach workers really have to work hard to build that trust back up with sure. them, and that might take a day, it might take a year, it might take a couple of years, you know, right. it just totally depends. Right. You know, one of the uh, complaints in, in the state of Michigan, I can't speak for some other states, but one of the complaints in the state of Michigan over the last, well, actually probably since the 70s, is that the mental health uh, field has been uh, reduced as far as uh, programs, money, and uh, places to help people. Um, I think twice over the last, since the 70s, the state has kind of emptied out the institutions. Mm -hmm. And um, so we often complain that there's no services or the services to help people with mental illness have been greatly diminished. How does, how does your group work getting people the help that they need under this, this environment where mental health has been neglected? Mm -hmm. Yeah, mental health is a huge part of what we do, getting people connected to mental health services, because like you said, a lot of people who are experiencing homelessness also have mental health disorders, and a lot of people also have substance use disorders. Right. And so those are two of the big things, um, trying to get people connected to, to those services. So um, we work really closely with the CMHs throughout the state, the community mental health agencies, um, but it is challenging. I mean. People have to meet a certain criteria in order mm -hmm. to be eligible for those services. Sure. And so some people do fall through the cracks because they're not eligible for those services, but then they only get, um, you know, a certain number. I think it's 20 outpatient visits per year through the regular Medicaid. Okay. So there's definitely a gap there. Sure, sure. Now, what is the, uh, you say there's three of you working in the city of Detroit. Can you kind of talk about what your, I guess, your caseload is and uh, how do they go about um, uh, financing it? Is it strictly through state funding or mm -hmm. does the federal government contribute? Just talk a little bit about your caseload. Uh, it's got to be sometimes very frustrating and seem overbearing, I would imagine. Mm -hmm. Correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, so we specifically don't work directly with clients, so I don't have like a necessarily a caseload of my own, but the agencies themselves have, yes, very large caseloads, mm -hmm. and um, they they have, there's a lot that's expected of them. Um, as far as, so the funding, the federal government funds um, a lot of the programs. A lot of it comes from the federal government to the state, and then the state distributes it to okay. agencies, so that's how it works for a lot of the sure. programs. Um, so like the Department of Housing and Urban Development um, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, those are two of the big funders. Mm -hmm. um, and right now, so like one of the programs that, the main program that I coordinate is um, we subcontract with two agencies for that program and they have around 120 people at each of their agencies just specifically with, um, in that program that wow. they're constantly working with, you know, the, that are on their caseload. Sure. Load. Well, I know before we got started, you mentioned you had some uh, phone numbers and some agencies that you wanted to tell people about because we're kind of nearing the end. Why don't you talk about some of those agencies and numbers that you wanted to mention? Yeah, sure. So like and I talked about before, we, um, we're we really encouraging communities, and a lot of communities have already done this, to have a single point of access. So um, the federal government, the Housing and Urban Development, um, sort of mandates this for states who receive their funding to have a single point of entry. And um, so that's something that as the state we're encouraging communities to do as well. And so basically how it works is that then somebody, somebody doesn't have to call a million numbers right. to figure out where to go. Because that can be daunting. Them. Exactly, yeah. yeah. And it can be frustrating and people then just stop and right. you know never get the services. So I have numbers for Macomb County, Oakland County, and Wayne County. Um, since we're in Oakland County, I thought those would be the most relevant. Sure. Um, do you want me just to say Sure, give, okay. them, give them out, and, and we will put them on the screen as well. So these are the numbers for the um, housing assessment and resource agencies, which are like the one-stop shop sort of thing in the county. So for Macomb County, it's the Macomb Homeless Coalition, and the number is 586-285-0400. For Oakland, it's the Housing Resource Center, and the number is 248-928-0111. And then for Wayne County, specifically Detroit, it's Southwest Solutions, which is 313-305-0311. 
And so if somebody is experiencing homelessness or at, they're at risk of losing their housing, mm -hmm. um, then they could call one of those numbers, you know, uh, depending on what county sure. they're located in and Absolutely. get help. Well, we appreciate all that you do. And, um, you know, being a, a social worker is probably going to be very frustrating at times because uh, I think dealing with people's problems is probably the hardest thing to do because sometimes uh, solutions are very difficult to come by and, and even times there are no solutions. But we commend you on all you do uh, through uh, uh, the state of Michigan, uh, Department of Health and Human Services. It's uh, a job that I think people underestimate and don't think about and don't give you enough credit. So we appreciate all that you do. Thank you. You're welcome. And uh, we would like to remember a fallen uh, American hero. And so if you'd stick around. Folks, if you look on the screen, I ask you to remember in your thoughts and in your prayers, First Lieutenant Arthur A. Green III of the Michigan Department of Natural Resources, who was killed in the line of duty on August 9, 2015. This man is truly a man of service and a great American hero. First Lieutenant Arthur Green was killed in an airplane crash in Harbor Springs, Michigan, while en route to a mandatory in-service training. He was on official travel status at the time when his Piper Cherokee that he was piloting struck a large tree while on its final approach to the Harbor Springs Municipal Airport at about 11 p.m. The wreckage was found the next day at 7.30 a.m. Lieutenant Green had served with the Michigan DNR Law Enforcement Division for 19 years, but he had worked prior to that with the Detroit Police Department and he had retired there after 20 years of service. And as I said, this guy's a great American hero. He's really a wonderful man. He'd also retired from the United States Air Force and the Michigan Air National Guard in 2004. So he believed in serving community and country. He is survived by his wife and two sons. So please again, remember in your thoughts and in your prayers, First Lieutenant Arthur A. Green III of the Michigan DNR. And please remember his wife and his family as well as well as his colleagues in the Michigan Department of Natural Resources. I want to thank our guest, Catherine Distillraff. Catherine, thank you once again. Thank and you. I hope to see you at the next uh, blood drive. Yeah, of course. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> that smiling face of yours. Folks, as Catherine in Michigan, state of Michigan, reach out to those who are in need and seeking homes. We reach out to you through the social media at the West Bloomfield Police Department. You can see us on Facebook or and Twitter, and we have Nixel, which you can sign up for, and we'll keep you in touch with uh, events occurring in your area. And we also have a new program called Crime Mapping. So keep in touch with the West Bloomfield Police Department on social media. And we would like you to keep in touch with us here at West Bloomfield 911. Don't forget to watch us on Civic Center TV. And if you can't catch us on the telly, you can watch us on demand at civiccentertv.com. Folks, take care of yourself. Be safe. Love one another. Remember, tomorrow is promised to no one. I'm Officer Rick, and I'll see you again on West Bloomfield 911.